Good morning. Welcome to Journey Church Online. I'm excited to share a few updates for this month with you. On Wednesday, August the 5th, the crash will be meeting one last time for the month before they take a break. They'll be resuming again in September. I'm excited to announce that the J-Kids has a brand new curriculum available on our website. If you have littles, I hope you'll hop over to check it out as soon as this service is over. It offers printables, including coloring sheets and memory verses, as well as a parent guide. I'm really excited to announce that on Sunday, August the 23rd, from 5 to 6 p.m., we will be hosting a J-Kids Back to Homeschool drive through If you and your littles can come on out, pick up their gift bag, and take a few pictures at our photo booth, we would love to have you attend. I'd also like to say thank you to everyone who gave so generously to our special projects lately. We really appreciate your generous heart. If you find yourself in a tight spot at this time, please reach out at help at avjourney.com. We would love to come beside you and offer you some support at this time.
Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the final weeks of summer 2020. I know some of you have already gotten your kids back into school, which is completely different from before. I mean, online school, it's uh, kind of more homeschooling than anything. Um, it's a crazy season, continues to be. Um, but today, I want to take in just a look at Scripture and bring us into the reality of what God is up to in the midst of whatever seems like it's going on around us and the craziness of our world and the craziness of this moment. There is a story God is writing. There's a plan God is actually unfolding that we are a part of. And so I, I'm excited about this new series we're in. We're studying the book of James. And this series is called Faith Works because it's all about how faith in our lives works. And last week, if you were with us, we, we talked about this one area of our lives that everybody goes through and it's the trials, the difficulties, the pain. And we kind of put it together how it all makes sense in God's great plan. And if you missed that, I really encourage you to go back, take a look at that one on our website. And it's, it's got some really critical information about the series that we're flowing into and through. Um, last week, we talked about the trials that, we're all, that we all face. And we learned that as followers of Jesus, Trials have a, v a couple of very important purposes in our life. First, we learn that they reveal, they show us what's really going on inside. And second, that they refine, that God uses the trials, the difficulties, the struggles, all of those things to make us in his image, to develop our character and our confidence in him. And so today we pick up in James chapter one, we'll be in verse 13, where James launches into another challenging topic that you and I all deal with. And this doesn't matter if you're first century or 21st century, it's the topic of temptation. And basically, a temptation is a really strong de desire to do something that we know we shouldn't do. It's, it's one of those things that it's a highly visible positive and a hidden negative. It's, it's one of those things where there's a short-term gain, I get what I want, but there's a long-term pain. And the gain is visible, but the pain is usually hidden away a little bit, so we go for it. And so temptation gives us a short-term thrill and a long-term <laughs> spill. What we learn in verse 13 is this, and I love this about James. In a world right now, if, if you're watching any of the political stuff, if you're watching any of the stuff that's going on in the news, you probably, like I, are so sick of the spin of you, you read a, an article and you see that it, it, the left is spinning this, the right is spinning that, and everybody's spinning a different way. All the major media is spinning things to their own ends for their own purposes. And you look at this stuff and you just feel sick about all the way that m information is being used and abused. It looks like a couple professional table tennis players just putting spin on everything that comes their way. And you kind of sit there going, what is the truth? That's why I love the book of James. Because James, the little brother of Jesus, is somebody who takes the spin off and just hits it straight. And sometimes in our lives, we just need somebody to tell us straight. And that's what we get from James. And I love how he takes in the, this topic in just, with just very few words, just goes right into it. When tempted, I love it. He doesn't, he doesn't use a lot of flowery speech. He doesn't go into a lot of background. He just says, when tempted, not if, but when. Because to James, temptation is a foregone conclusion. We're all going to be tempted. And, and it's important to remember that being tempted isn't sin. To be tempted is to be human. I mean, Jesus himself was tempted. It was after Jesus was baptized by John and he was led into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. He fasted and it says Satan came and tempted him. So temptation, but the thing is, Jesus never gave in to the temptation, and that's where we all want to be. He never sinned. And so we learn, this is what we learn from James. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. You see, we're all influenced by our culture. We're, we're all influenced by the world around us and the places we live, the people we work with, the, the things that are shown on TV. It's true now, it's, it's true then, it's always been true. We're all influenced by the world and the situation, circumstances, the culture around us. Well, the writing that we are reading today was not written into a vacuum. James was writing into a very specific cultural moment. 
What had happened, James had seen the church explode after Jesus was crucified and resurrected. And all of these people, thousands of people, came rushing then to follow him as they literally had seen him crucified. And then they physically saw him alive and walking around. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people began to follow and put their faith in Jesus. Well, of course, this didn't sit well with the Jewish leaders or the Roman government. Both saw as a, this was a threat to their power, so they crushed. They came out in full hatred and tried to crush this movement. And with the power of Rome and the hate of the Jewish religious movement, the Christians were cast all over the Roman Empire. It was called the Diaspora or the Dispersion. They were dispersed all over. They just grabbed, literally grabbed their families, grabbed their few belongings, and they left to avoid the death and persecution that it broke out against the church. Well, there's more to the story because in the first century Roman world, the belief system was in a pantheon of gods. They were just tons and tons of gods. And the gods that they believed in, in the Greco-Roman world, were very much like us. They were very human-like. They had all the worst traits of humans that we struggle with, like pride and jealousy and lust and anger and all these kinds of things. And the Roman, the, in the first century, they believed that their gods were responsible for a lot of the things they were experiencing in life, a lot of the pain, hardship, even the death sometimes they faced. Because the Roman gods were petty and capricious and people-like. They enjoyed toying with people's lives. They enjoyed messing with people even tempting them. And so from that, we find here's James speaking into that cultural story, that cultural moment. And that's when he comes up with, you need to understand, for those of you who are coming into this relationship with the one true God, there is one God who exists in Father, Son, and Spirit in three persons, and you need to know what kind of God he is. And that's the crux of this understanding about temptation. We need this today. The Hebrew God is nothing like the false gods of Rome or Greece. So James sets out to teach them what the one true God is like. He says this, he said, when somebody's tempted, you can't say God is tempting me for God cannot be tempted by evil. See, their gods were tempted by all kinds of things. Their gods were running about, jumping from bed to bed and killing people they didn't like. Well, their gods were easily tempted, but Jehovah, He's saying the one true God cannot, it's not even in his nature. It's not even something he's capable of. God has no capacity for temptation. And you wonder, well, how's that true? Well, when you're the God who owns everything, what can you be tempted by? It's all yours. You can do anything you want. There is no temptation for the God who owns it all. And it says then, and nor does he tempt anyone. Because the God that we serve, the God of the heavens, the true one true God, he doesn't get any kicks or thrills out of temper, just messing with us or, or testing us in these ways, or he doesn't play little games with his creatures. It's not in his nature to toy with us or to tempt us. That's a really important point because people love to cast blame for their temptations. I mean, this is true of all of us. This goes back to the very beginning. The very first sinners in the Bible were the very first humans. You've got to realize that Adam and Eve, the very first creatures on the earth, they had this relationship where at one point God told them, you can eat from all the trees in the garden, but except for this one. And when he was away, you know, he was never really away, but he, these people chose. Eve saw that the fruit was good for eating and it looked delicious and the and the tempter, the, you know, the devil came and told her how great it would be. So, of course, Eve bit the, the fruit. She gave it to Adam. He ate the fruit. And then God comes in and says, what have you done? And what is Adam's response? Adam says, well, God, the woman you put here, the woman you gave me, she gave me some of the fruit and I ate it. In other words, God, listen, listen um, it's really your fault. You're the one who put her here. You're the one who made her look like that. And how could I say no to her? I mean, God, really, it's not my fault. And blame shifting doesn't really work with God. James is coming out and saying, listen, if you want to understand what's going on inside of you when you're tempted, you need to realize first and foremost, it's not from God. 
God doesn't toy with you. God, it's not in his nature to be tempted. It's not in his nature to tempt you. And then he tells us where temptation actually comes from. He said, but each person is tempted when we're dragged away by our own evil desires, by, he says, by their own evil desires, they are enticed. Now, it's really interesting, very descriptive words that James uses here. When he uses the word, the Greek word for drags away, it's a hunting term. And the picture that he's painting is of a trap that is set for prey. The, the animal steps into it, and then the hunter comes along, takes the animal in the trap, and drags it away to either be slaughtered or to enslave it or whatever. That's what he says happens when you and I step into temptation. It's something that our own inner hearts desire something, and we step into that trap and then are dragged away by it. There's another word he uses that he says that we're enticed. And the word here is a word that's used for fishing. When I was young, I used to love in the summertime, on occasion, my parents would let me go to my grandparents' house. My grandparents lived near a lake, and so my grandpa loved fishing. My grandpa Berg would even have his own old refrigerators out in the back. It was just like these old chests, you know, that he would, he would raise earthworms and red worms and all these different kinds of worms because he loved to use them for fishing so much. So I remember we'd take our little old Folger can and we'd go out there and we'd go through the dirt and we'd fish out a handful of the best worms we could find. And then we would go to bed and early in the morning before the sun rose, we'd be up and grandpa would be fixing pancakes. We'd get all the fishing poles and all the gear in our lunches and we'd get in the little car and we'd head to the lake. And I remember one of the weirdest things, one of, it's just really, you know, one of those things you learned as a kid and that was how to put the worm on the hook. Now, Grandpa, would te he would give us the lesson. He would show us how you thread a, a worm on a hook. But friends, here's the thing. That was the hardest thing, and that was the weirdest thing because the hook looks so big, and as you put the little worm on, you, you feel terrible for the worm, for one. But then you're thinking, how could this ever catch a fish? The hook is so obvious. I mean, the worm's on it, but you can still see the hook and the barb and all that stuff. And it was funny. We take that thing and we throw it out in the water, <clears throat> and you think about the fish that's in the water little fish going along and then it sees that little worm wiggling on the hook and it's like, ooh, what is that? And, and it's comical that you picture that fish going, oh my goodness, you know, and, it, and, it, and just kind of goes over to it and it sees this worm on a hook and it's almost like the worm's going, hey. And this stupid fish, it just can't help itself. It can't help itself, it has to bite. It's like free food and even though the hook is obvious, it goes for it. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, I think, if fish really do live in schools, how can they be so dumb? I mean, how can they never learn? Fish never learn. People have been catching them from the beginning of time and they've been using hooks. And still, you think in their schools they teach, but you think that they would learn, you think they would see and they would stop biting the hook. Friends, I gotta tell you, fish can't say no to their appetites. And what James is warning us here, he's saying that in our fallen human natures, we have a tendency to bite that thing in spite of the pain it's going to bring. That with our short-sightedness in our human frailty, we see desires, we see something we want, and it tricks us into thinking we can get away with it. We don't get hooked. We won't, it won't be us. And, and we all know better, right? We, we know better because we've experienced it. We've all had a friend or a family member who couldn't resist some temptation, they got too close and they got hooked. The party habit became an addiction. Now they can't get free. Maybe, maybe it was flirting that turned into something a little more nefarious. Maybe, maybe it was a hookup. Maybe now there's a child in a relationship that was never wanted or desired. Maybe somebody you care about blew up their marriage or their career with an affair or with an embezzlement or with a really bad decision that they've made. Maybe it was a lie that we, you were caught in and it just, it had hooked your life and took, took it in a direction you never intended. That's what happens. 
And we read about this in the news every day. Somebody is caught for tax invasions, evasion. Some, somebody gets, you know, get caught cheating in their company, tells a lie, and, and it's usually some high profile person. Somebody bites down on the hook. Somebody can't resist the temptation because they thought they were different. They thought they wouldn't get caught. They thought nobody would ever know. But the scripture has this funny way. It tells us, be sure you are aware. Know this, your sins will find you out. In other words, you can't hide your sin. And if we move in that direction, I've heard it, friends, I've heard it a million times. As a pastor, actually, this is kind of the one of the most recurring things I hear. It's like, it's not like that, Pastor Dave. I know what I'm doing. It won't happen to me. I'm different. It's not a problem. I'm not an addict. I can stop any time. It's not a big deal. You know, whatever. I, I hear it all the time, friends. And I just want to take a minute just to tell you from, from the story I'm reading, from the, from the teachings of James, just to break down two truths about every temptation you will ever face that you need to understand. Two truths that you're going to, about just, just any temptation I can think of. Two truths about that. Number one is this. There is always more at stake than what you think. There's always more at stake than what you think. That hook, that worm, that thing that you see, that temptation that's right out there, whatever it is, there's more at stake than you think. Oh, it's just a little thing. Nobody will ever know. It's, you know, in the privacy of my own life, what happens in Vegas, all these kinds of things. That's because we don't understand there's a spiritual component to everything. For the physical world and all that we see and all that we think is happening, there is a spiritual reality that is absolutely as but even more important that is parallel to this where things are happening that we can't see this life the decisions we make there is more at stake than you and i ever dreamed the second truth is that when it comes to temptation your ability to withstand temptation has a lot to do with your confidence in god it may sound weird but it's true that when it comes to temptation, your ability to withstand, to push off, to stop, to not bite, bite onto that hook has so much to do with your belief and confidence in God. Now, these two truths are powerful and they tend to, basically, when we're in that, that heated moment, that moment of temptation, it can easily, these things can easily slide off the radar. They can, they can slide off the screen when your focus is on that thing you want. It's that heat of the moment thing. So what I want to teach us to do and what I believe James is teaching us to do is pause. When you're, and there's that split second when a temptation is about to overtake you, that split second where you have a choice to make. You can go this way and go right into the hook or you can go this way and you can get yourself out of the way. And what James would have us do, first pause and then bring these two truths back into focus. Because if we don't, we're going to live with pain and regret and disappointment. We're going to live with heartache and loss and loss of trust and respect, even loss of careers and things, loss of dreams. But if we do, pause and remember, there's always more at stake. And my ability to resist has a lot, has a lot to do with how I believe about God and my confidence in him. And this is where we're going with this. And so it's not just a matter of self-control, by the way. I'm actually, you know, it's actually connected to what I believe about God. So here's the powerful truth about temptation. Undisciplined desires win. When it comes to a battle of your desires, the undisciplined, the one that you haven't beaten down or taken control of or put that you haven't prepared for, it'll win. Because the desires we don't control will one day control us. Let me say it again. The desires we don't control now will one day control us. When it comes to battling those darker parts of ourselves, the, the, the destructive passion, the undisciplined wants inside of us, what we don't learn to control will one day control us. Now that's the weakness of human nature. And so what we need to do is move on in the text because James goes on to say this in verse 15. After desire has conceived, and he's using pregnancy terms here. So a desire, you know, after it's conceived, it's, we've kind of gone with it. It's gotten pregnant. Now what does it do? It gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth 
to death. He's saying there is a natural progression in what happens when we give in to temptation. We give in to that desire and that desire creates sin. It actually is a fallen state, a disconnect between us and God. In that disconnect between us and God, that thing, that sin grows and comes to the point where it produces death. When we give in, we sin. When we sin, something dies. I, I, I love that in this world of subtleties, in this world of PC culture, Jesus' little brother, James, just shoots it straight. He said, there are consequences to our temptations, and he doesn't soften the blow. He tells us giving into temptation leads to sin, and sin leads to death. <clears throat> Huge consequences. I don't know if you've heard that lately, friends, but if you're surrendering to a temptation, if you're giving into something you know is leading you on a path away from God, in no uncertain terms, he's saying, that's creating death in part of your life. Sin always leads to death. So again, you've seen this happen. You were caught in a lie. And then you had to make up another lie. And then you had to take it. And then all of a sudden, you've got this whole thing that just ends up in a completely tied up mess. You were caught in a habit. Somebody discovered your browsing history. Somebody saw your text messages. Somebody found your phone and unlocked and they saw something. Somebody read, heard, got up the rumor. Somebody, somebody found out what you did in Vegas or on that business trip. Somebody learned something. And all of a sudden, you're caught. All of a sudden, you feel the hook sink in. <clears throat> And you experience one part of that death that James is talking about because you death, death to a relationship, maybe death to a job, maybe death to a family you know, connection, maybe death to a love. Uh, and, and you feel like, oh my gosh, you know, I lost somebody's trust. But that's only the death right here and now. That's only the physical side of things. James is pointing to an ultimate reality that's even greater than that. He's saying, Never forget the eternal consequences to sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death in Romans 6.23. And not only talking about physical death, this is eternal separation from God, from life, from heaven. This is literally hell. And the reality that James is saying we all face is this. When you think you got away with, there's more at stake. There's always more at stake than what you think. But, but then James, James turns a corner. Okay, that sounds like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm in big trouble. I've done quite a few things. I've given into temptation. So where am I at? Well, this is where James takes us. James goes on next. When it comes to temptation, our ability to withstand temptation has a lot to do with our confidence in God. Remember that? Verse 16, he goes on. But don't be deceived. He just finished this whole discourse about temptation and what it does to us. And then he goes on. Don't be deceived. In other words, don't be fooled. Don't lie to yourself. And don't let Satan lie to you about the reality of how things are in God's world. Listen to what he says. My dear brothers and sisters. Notice the change of tone here. I mean, he's like pretty aggressive, just, just laying it out, what happens when we give in to temptation. But now all of a sudden he gets this tender tone. He goes, my brothers and sisters. He, he's looking at us like the older brother, <clears throat> looking out for his siblings. He calls us brothers and sisters. And he warns us, verse 17. My dear brothers and sisters, every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. So here's another contrast. He's showing that our great God is unlike any of the little g gods, any of the false gods that the culture has been shoving down their throat. He's saying that every good thing in life is actually from God. So that thing and temptation is usually basically a spin on something you think you want or need, which you may, but that you're going to get it from a different source or in a different way. God has a plan to give you certain things in your life in a certain time in your life, in a certain way in your life, because all good gifts, that means sex and prosperity and good careers and all good things, all good things, James says, come from God. He's put them here because he loves you. This is where it's so important for us to understand. Everything we need most in life, everything you desire most in life, is a gift from our Father in heaven. Unlike the fake gods, the Greek and Roman gods, the God doesn't, our God doesn't have a bad mood. 
It, he's always the same. He knows exactly what we need when we need it. And he's working his plan in us to give it when it's time. In verse 18, he chose to give us what was one of the greatest gifts he gave. He gave us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. And this brings me back to the second point about your ability to withstand temptation having a lot to do with your confidence in God. Because here's the reality. <clears throat> I think we fall into temptation sometimes because we really don't understand God. We don't really understand his plan. We don't really understand that he knows what's best. It's kind of like he is the one who made you. He designed you. And he knows exactly what is best for you, what will truly make you happy. You think you know what makes you happy? No, you know what makes you feel good for a moment, what releases endorphins in a moment, in a second. God knows what you really want. He knows what would really give you ultimate joy and happiness and release all those endorphins over a long period of life. God knows what's best. And the thing is, you and I sometimes aren't convinced. This is why I said, don't be deceived. We're not convinced that he's a great father. We're not convinced that our heavenly father is crazy about us. And so we think we have to take it into our own hands. We've got to do it in our own way. We've got to get what we want for ourselves. And James is saying he wants to give us the very best. That's why he gave us commandments. That's why he gave us rules and structures. Because he wants to unfold the story, the plan, the gifts in a specific way in our lives. Knows just when to do it. His love is so great, he's keeping us from death or from prematurely experiencing things that could actually harm us rather than develop us. God's goal for us is not, in, in, is not just temptation avoidance. God's goal is not just to keep us from doing wrong things. God's goal is transforming our hearts. It's setting up his kingdom. It's developing his rule and reign on the earth in you and I as his kids. It's, it's becoming the kind of people who don't just, who don't just not do things because we're going to get punished. We don't do things because they're not even appealing to us. Because our trust in God, our confidence in God is so great that we know his plan is the best plan. <clears throat> and that's hard to keep in mind. God's goal was not to create humanity just to avoid falling into temptation. God's goal was a new humanity. Where men and women with transformed hearts live together in a new community. Honor one another like brothers and sisters made in the image of God. It's a world where his kingdom comes because his will is done. It's a world where the trap, the hook of temptation, no longer is a danger to us because our confidence in his love, his plan, his way of doing life is so secure. We have such confidence in him. We no longer are tempted by lesser things. It's kind of like if you knew you had a royal banquet waiting for you at home, would you stop and eat roadkill on the way home? I know that's so stupid, ridiculous, and outside of reality. But listen, this is exactly what James is saying. Why do we feast on roadkill, on the lesser things, when God has a banquet prepared? He's got a plan for us that is so much better. And that's what we're doing when we distrust God, take the scraps of our evil desires and get a hold of that hook. But you see, James, James is so passionate about this. He is so concerned about the people in his church family and his little brothers and sisters that he just shoots it straight and says, listen, this is where it is. And as I close, just a couple quick things, a couple tools I want to give you to put you, this in place for you as you literally like, this is how we can approach this temptation game. Here's what happens. When we're drawn by our own lusts and temptations, James goes on in chapter 4, verse 7 to say, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and he will come close to you. So first of all, again, right in that split second when you feel like you're, you're in, you see that thing and you're about to click to move to that next screen or whatever, you, you see that post or that whatever, and, and it could take you somewhere. You, you turn down that road, you're on your way home, and you could go this way or that way. You, whatever that thing is where you're like, you're tempted to tell the story, to spin it a little this way. You're tempted to twist the information a little bit that way, make yourself look better, whatever. You want to gossip. In that moment, just before that thing happens, when you have that flash of recognition, because God is gracious, he gives us that. In that moment, resist. 
Number one, resist. Pause, then resist. That means say no to the devil. He says, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. In other words, push back, do not give in, go the other way. Which direction we go? So we resist, then we run. We submit to God, we run to God. Whatever is tempting you right now, literally run to God. In other words, God, I need your help. I need your help right now. Come close to God and he will come close to you is the promise James gives us. Then remember, so we're going to resist, we're gonna run to God, we're gonna remember. Remember what's at stake. Remember that this is going to cost more than it says. The price tag is hidden. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Go with him. Go his way. And he will make your path straight. He will direct your steps. He will find, place the stones in front of you. Trust in him. Which is leading me to the last one. Seek reinforcements. We need reinforcement. We need help. We need support. If you're being tempted to whatever, you can't fight alone. God never intended you to. That's why James says, listen, brothers and sisters, he's like, we're in this together. We're all facing this. We all go into tr trials and temptations. And when we do, we need each other. And, and this accountability is critical. Seek help. Talk to somebody. Get a counselor. Get an accountability group. Get it with a couple friends that you know have maybe been down the road and are, are further developed in this area. Maybe they've struggled with this and they've overcome I love what Proverbs 3, 7 and 8 goes, it goes on from 6 and 7. It says, then two are better than one because there's better return for their labor. When one falls down, there's somebody to pick them up. That's what we need, friends. And can I be honest with you? I'm just going to be really, just really transparent for a moment. The thing that I struggle with the most about this COVID quarantine thing is that my fear is, and I, I just hear rumors and I just catch little things here on social media or whatever, which I rarely ever even look at, but my fear is that the hook has become more tempting when we're not in the school of warning, when people aren't around, when we're not there to support each other. The temptation to sleep in and maybe just let those other things, you know, oh, I'll look at it later. The temptation to let your Bible, your prayer time, the, the, those things take a back seat. The temptation to give in a little more to those things that, oh, that's not really that big of a deal. No, everybody does it or it's not, nobody's gonna know. Those things that cause your heart to drift away from God, my, my concern, and if I were James talking to my, my family members, I would say, friends, your temptations are not uncommon, but they are truly going to wreck us. And that's why I struggle with our separation in this season, and I'm praying deeply and talking with our leaders about how to address this. Friends, God is calling us to support and strengthen one another and and I just, as your pastor, I'm just telling you right now, don't let your guard down. Don't let the evil one take this moment and take advantage. Don't bite the hook. So today, if you hear these words, if God is speaking to you through this message, come back. Draw away from that thing. Make a decision that you are going to do those four things. You're going to resist the devil. You're going to run back to God. You're going to remember what's at stake. And you're going to seek reinforcements. Friends, I want to pray with you right now, and I just want to ask you to join me in a final word of prayer as, as we bring this all to a head. Can I, can I pray with you? Heavenly Father, as we, as we stand before you, sit before you, you know, watch this together, it's a reality that all of us are facing temptations of various kinds. And right now, maybe the temptation is to give up. Maybe it's to let our faith just fall aside and just say, I've got to look out for myself. Maybe it's to, maybe it's to give in to fear or worry or maybe it's to give in to temptation that actually is sexual or financial or just a character lapse. God, whatever it is, we're all facing temptations all the time. And my prayer is that as your people, as your kids, that we would pause in those moments where it's coming on us. That we would look, we would look and see the hook behind the worm. We would actually, that we would understand there's always a greater cost. There's always, always more at stake than what we see. And that we would turn and run back to you because, because our confidence in you really does give us the ability. When we see what you offer, when we see what you desire, it gives us the ability to say no to sin. Your dream for us is so much better, God. Let us, 
let us trust you. Lead us to trust you. And if you're here today and you need just, just right now, I just encourage you just to pray a simple prayer of surrender. God, I've given into temptation. You know them all. And you can list them if you want, but God, here's what I want. I want forgiveness. I need to be cleansed. I want to put my faith in what Jesus did on the cross, but then I want you to turn me into the kind of person to trust you and to follow your way because your way always leads to the greatest life. I give you my life. I put my faith in you today. And I will now follow Jesus with all I am. Friends, today I just want to, one final verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, God is faithful when we're tempted. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but he, when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can endure it. This week, watch for the way out. Shame is a prison It's cruel as a grave Shame is a robber And he's come to take my name Oh, love is my redeemer Lifting me up from the ground Love is the power Where my freedom song is found There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down When I hear that trumpet sound Gonna rise up out of the ground there ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down oh,
body down There ain't no grave To hold this body down No grave to hold this body down.